Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's um, according to the Spotify playlist of the year or whatever it's called. Um, it's my most played record. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you ever yeah. listen to the uh, FDL soundtrack? Uh, no. That's like one of my one of my favorites to work to. You yeah. Try it if you like that. Yeah. I think. Well, maybe maybe I have. Oh. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So. I think that. <laughs> I remember uh, at home, at least sort of when I was still with my parents, the remote control used to uh, end up on top of the TV. And I was, I was like, that is just not how are you supposed to? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Oh, did I, did I schedule this for like 10 past? Or is it? Oh, it's 16, 18. Okay. All oh, right, right, right. Okay. So, come on. So I think, yeah, it's it's a very interesting it's a very interesting thing, and I wonder how much of these kinds of ideas we can we can eventually um, transfer to uh, economical insights, to maybe even um, data science and evolutionary mm -hmm. insights. Because what I think is is um, <coughs> hey, how's it going? Man? It's really yeah. difficult. For example, um, whether so I think I think. Um, for example, one of the one of the things that's really important is to have these controls in place in a way that is not um, okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, leave it open for now. There might still be people coming. Um, so I'll just click the bar. If it does, if it doesn't, then I'll just need to. I'm just using the directions here. Thank you. Okay. okay. Let's not do that. Let's cancel. Let's cancel instead. Okay. Maybe I should cancel it now. Okay. Um, click this. Cool. So, I think I've tried to clean the system at like uh, ten in the morning and have <laughs> not finished it since. It was a bit of a full day. Some people, oh, good, right? some people don't um, <coughs> work a lot in the last week before Christmas, and uh, yeah. for us somehow it went like, oh hey, cool, that's this project, and this seems to be starting. <laughs> or maybe we can start this in January. Let's prepare something, and yeah. So it, it all got crammed. It was, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's in a good way, though, like, oh, in, a, in a really cool way. Like, we've got a whole bunch of things where we're thinking, awesome. oh, this is, this is going to be really cool. Oh, we need this. And then you get lost in, like, oh, I could, you know, make this better and polish this. And, yeah. So. Bing. Very good. Is that, are those rocks or is that coral? Uh, I don't know. That's one of the desert. It's Desert 4, one oh, of the yeah, default so backgrounds in, uh, in uh, the thing. Yeah, I definitely would have guessed coral. Yeah, because it could look like coral, but then you can see grass at the bottom. Yeah. What looks yeah, like grass? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Much short, so. yeah. Maybe it's one of the. Um, maybe it's one of the. Um, uh, it's a shot from the X Files or something. Oh, uh, like mm -hmm. a sort of an edited. Oh, it's it's design. definitely edited. Like there's no way that that's natural lighting. Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing computer vision on that, I'm not sure what it would <laughs> come back as. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. yeah. So are you studying computer science or data science? Engineering. Engineering. Ah, oh, cool. So m you more of a consider yourself more of a roboticist, or how do you? Electrical. Ah, okay. Oh, how come you're interested in like signal processing? Sorry. I'm more interested in like signal processing. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Than audio engineering. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> audio processing is best signal processing. Yeah. Clear. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> 
have you started as an audio engineer? Where did you, how did you? Um, Probably just started like this sort of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But how did you get into, into audio engineering in the first place? What was your? I think you're saying you just took a class in it. Am I right? You took a class in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In class in audio engineering? Not, um, not really audio engineering, but uh -huh. uh, audio signal processing. Uh, oh. oh, I was going to take a class in that. <laughs> and then it was really hard, so I dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of math. Yeah, that was a crazy one. So I don't remember. Right. Uh, and actually, at this point, we're going to kind of transition the course. Interesting. Yeah. So, if I if I may just quickly ask, so did, did, how did you start? Like, you you literally what, did you have any any uh, previous experience with audio engineering, or is it, was it literally you took that class and you thought, oh, this is really cool? How did you? Uh, probably it's because because I play music. Ah, oh, all right. What do you play? Guitar. Electric ah, guitar. okay. Mm -hmm. Like, but the normal a lot of people doing that. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, so right. That is interesting. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Ah, hello, Internet. We have a viewer, and it's not me checking my feed, so um, <laughs> welcome. Um, yeah, um, as, as before, actually, I should, I have to feed you. So um, oh, nice. feel free to feel free to um, grab a beer on, uh, from the fridge. I don't know. Uh, in, uh, in the spirit of uh, responsible sorting of alcohol and so on, I have to make sure that you're... Um, yeah, it's been a bit busy. I like, oh, yeah. get catch up on sleep when I can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it busy at work? Uh, I do some contract stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. um, kind of kind of busy. Just resetting my sleep pattern. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. know that's like. What's that? I know that's yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a couple nights ago that, like, so for no reason, that I just had, like, crazy insomnia for, like, three days. Oh, yeah. I just, like, couldn't sleep. Yeah, and so then, like yeah. after that, when I finally could start sleeping again, it was like it just like, it takes forever. Yeah, it takes. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's no magic formula for me yet, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just for brute force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, what about you? What how's your week been? Um, it's been good. I uh, worked most of the week on um, my master's application. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so I submitted that finally. Okay. Just what what uh, masters are you? What's your, what are you hoping to? Um, to? Just the, probably like CS. Oh, yeah. CS, yeah. There's um, like an AI organization. It's like a joint venture between like a few Montreal universities. Oh, yeah. So I applied to them. It's pretty competitive, so we'll see if I get they it. They've got some, yeah, because kind of Canada, I mean, I don't know I don't know much, but it seems like, you know, it's a lot of the people that sort of started d deep learning. Yeah. Seem to come from that, so. Yeah, yeah, like so, some of the big names are like from my school. Like oh, really? Yoshua Benjio, maybe. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen so, him in the halls. Oh, really? Yeah. So I imagine it is probably a bit competitive. Yeah, it's there. pretty competitive. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think like, locals have an edge up. So, I don't know. This, and, um, yeah, oh, Wayne will be soon. Uh, I'm sure he's to the washroom or something, oh. yeah. Uh, the bathrooms uh, are at the end of the hall. Oh. The end of the hall, um, to the right. Um. Yes. Ha! Huh. So we did not start playing out for the internet. Oh, these are good Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did yours froth? Or a little bit. A little bit. Mm. Maybe I'm just too forceful. <laughs> I guess lucky us, but also um, a bit unfortunate that um, there was so much going on, too much to prepare. 
Mm, no time to set up things. Ah, uh, yeah, wait, as I meant to say before, um, the bathrooms are at the end of the hall. Oh, oh I, right. just, yeah. I just moved it. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, have you been doing anything interesting, reinforcement anyways? Um, I've been do looking, well, I've been a little bit busy lately, but um, mm. I do always try and catch up on, I've been actually focusing a little bit more on um, counterfactual regret. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Oh, interesting, counterfactual regret. Yeah, minimize it. What yeah. is it? It's, um, uh, I guess you heard about Pluribus. Pluribus, oh, it's what, uh, Facebook created the, um, the poker bot that can beat the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, one-on-one. -on -one, oh, yeah, I okay. Guess. They yeah, mm -hmm. so that was, that was called Pluribus, and um, mm. they use counterfactual regret minimization. It's more about, I mean, technically, you can use reinforcement learning for game theory, but this is more like designed for game theory. So you act it actually plays a certain move uh, in a mixed strategy, so like 20% this move and 80% that move, whereas reinforcement learning generally is deterministic, so it'll pick just the best move all the time, generally. Like, you could probably change the algorithm so it doesn't do that, but... Yeah, yeah reinforcement well. learning techniques can learn stochastic policies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, especially um, policy gradient algorithms are no longer deterministic. Uh, there. So, yeah. yeah, you could, so, but um, this one's like, basically from the ground up, it's designed for mixed strategy and um, uh, games like poker. But um, mm -hmm. just being delving into that, there's a lot of different methods and they were kind of secretive in the paper, so it's kind of like one of the oh, yeah. situations where I'm just like, uh -huh. How, like trying to figure out you know mm. <laughs> exactly how they did it, but obviously um they can't release that information. So yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's just diving into that, um, right, starting right. from the trying to go from the ground up. Because when I first started reinforcement learning, I went kind of too high without doing all the groundwork, the and then like yeah. halfway through, you know what? I'm just going to start from the bottom. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> the getting <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you mean they were playing it close to their chest? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nicely done, my friend. <laughs> <clears throat> well, my wife's pregnant. I've got to practice. Um, <laughs> yeah. But so counterfactual regret is um, that was their loss function for the yeah. So it's like um, how like what is the regret of me not choosing that move? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of similar to reinforcement learning in some ways. Just kind of like backwards, kind of like if I had of not because it's more like it will just play moves and then uh, if the enemy does something uh, and you lose, it's like oh. You know what, what? What could have been if I had mm -hmm, played that move mm -hmm. instead? So, Interesting. so it'll kind of play, and when it it'll kind of go closer to Nash um, without trying at all. It'll kind of like learn from what the opponent does, and when it loses, it's mm -hmm, like, oh shit, mm -hmm, I should mm -hmm. actually check that path more. Interesting. And then uh, it's actually it's not a very complex algorithm. I think it's, it's it was more to do with how they uh, minimize the states, like you know, compress the states, yeah. like abstraction, because yeah. I think that was really they had mm -hmm. Facebook engineers, mm -hmm. so it's like. Yeah. Even if you knew the algorithm, you might not be able to get that performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Where do you look to uh, keep up on that kind of stuff? Uh, just the best thing is um, Google Scholar and just type in well reinforcement learning. You can type in uh, you know reinforcement learning, but then put in all the names of the big guys like Noam. Well, for counterfactual kind of regret, it's Noam Brown, mm -hmm. and uh, what his name of his uh, supervisor. But he had a supervisor. So I put his name in, mm -hmm. uh, and then for reinforcement learning, I put in a few names, but um. Also put in like alpha zero or alpha star because mm -hmm. all the papers kind of that link they'll refer to that. You say for right. citations, you put title plus citations uh -huh. uh, references so that way like and it, like weekly it'll give you a feed. And oh you yeah. Put, yeah. So you pretty so you much have, like, an alert on there. Or what? Yeah, it just sends me an email once oh, a week and uh, in that uh -huh. email or to have um uh actually it's a separate email for each topic that I put and then mm -hmm. I click mm -hmm. on it and then it. Gives me, and then you give, you're always up to date. You can't miss anything as long as you put in good that's, keywords. That's mm -hmm. very smart. Yeah, so. That's a good idea, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how you always stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. You yeah. have the new papers as soon as they come that's, out. That's yeah. So. I wonder, but there's Google Scholar. Why isn't there Google Muso? Because yeah, I had a friend. Well, I had a friend complain about recently about, and I'm not sure whether this is necessarily a reinforcement learning problem, but <clears throat> um, I think there's now more music on YouTube or like than there has ever been in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> it's almost as if, if you if you actively, like, if you spend time looking, mm -hmm. yeah, you can literally blow your mind every day on YouTube. Like, oh, yeah, I've, I've been looking, for some, for, for some reason, I got into Outlaw Blues recently, mm -hmm. whatever that means, but um, I hadn't uh, looked into Blues Saraceno um, for a while, and now he does this amazing sort of dark, bluesy, really sort of almost like, Epic, so a sense of anarchy kind of soundtracky mm. kind of stuff. Yeah. 
and it's really cool and the dude can play it's so amazing and so i started looking more into blues and i came across a whole bunch of artists that i'd never heard before and they're absolutely amazing and so a friend of mine was complaining that um at the same time there's there's so much choice but on the other hand um there are also suddenly so many genres yeah, 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 yeah. and all of this kind of thing and so the recommendation engines he he complained were like too bad to really mm -hmm. save him time in looking for uh, new interesting yeah. music yeah um <clears throat> And I noticed it on Spotify too. And, and one of the things, for example, that, that I really like is instrumental music. And yeah, yeah. Um, I also like heavy metal, so I quite like heavy metal instrumental music. But as soon as you pick a couple of songs like that on Spotify, make a playlist, and then let it wander off on its own, it doesn't take very long until your nice little gen is also joined by someone going... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and while I know a couple of people who do this and this is technically very admirable and all that sort of thing, it's just not my kind of music. And so I'm somewhat disappointed that there's no easy way to sort this out. And so we were thinking about, you know, uh, feeds that should be able to tell you like what's interesting in your field, in your kind of music. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Google Music. Yeah, I'm thinking because Shazam could probably tell the, the difference better between songs, I imagine. They have yeah. like a whole bunch of data. They, they, go, oh, they have the yeah, label, yeah. like, mm. distinguished, like, unsupervised learning, I guess, even. Mm. Cause, yeah. Well, maybe we should start this. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Sell yeah. to Google, get rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be, but it would be, like, from a, from a, um, from a theoretical standpoint, I, would, I, would, I think it would already be interesting to look at, like, how would you go about this? Would you want to, um, would you want to, look at it as a problem that you do from a signal processing standpoint do you, do you want to listen to the music yeah and do what do you how do you um analyze the signal yeah do you just look at the waveform so you, you keep all the phase information and everything do you want to look at the just that time series of uh, voltage say yeah or would you want to have would you would you want to do an fft and would you want to look at the um, spectral information at at each time step right so what is an FFT for it? Uh, a fast Fourier transformation. So it's like the way the graph comes. You can either yeah you can either look at um, the for um, in principle you can either look at the at the pressure information mm -hmm. at, a thing, at a specific point in time, which is what the electro uh, the the electrical signal when you have a microphone and it goes whoop, yeah. whoop, whoop, whoop. that's literally just the um, electric translation of what is that jittering so um, <coughs> the electric translation of the air pressure yeah, yeah. on the on the microphone's um, membrane on the capsule's membrane, and so you can either look at the pressure um, information or yeah. the voltage information right mm -hmm. at at a point in time, or you can translate that using this this Fourier transformation um, into the um, frequency information, like the intensity of frequencies at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But they're different. Um, representations of the different um, like uh, of each transformation they um, result in they have they, con they contain different information so there's information loss from uh, the transformation or during the transformation from a, um, a waveform into its uh, spectral uh, representation and the, the information that you lose is the phase the phase combinations so the fact the phase of the signal and some people say oh no 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 that is that is vital information. The actual combination that makes the waveform, that makes this sort of pressure curve, mm. that is vital information because it contains certain time and um, time relation information that you don't get in this <coughs> in the spectral representation. And so um, I look at it going, well, you know, actually that's just one more time series. Why don't you give it both mm. if you want it? But I guess it could also it could also be doubling up. It's but then, on the other hand, why, why wouldn't you necessarily, what kind of metadata could you create that, like for example, um, you, could, you could also add factors to it, right? If you had someone labeling it, could you act, act, uh, add things like um, instrumental? Could you add things like the key that the song is in or the, you know, the amount of chords that are used throughout the chord, uh, throughout the song, that sort of thing? Yeah. So it's just like feature adding, getting as many features yeah, as yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. And then would you do that with... Because Spotify is labeled, but it's not labeled like to that extent. There's no mm -hmm. like key and stuff. Yeah. It's just like these are genres it could go into. Mm -hmm. And then it probably says that based on this genre, most people also like listen to that. But if you don't, then maybe it doesn't know that. Either. There's a, yeah, there's a, let me just call this up here. Um, there actually is um, 
a website called, and this is an absolutely amazing thing, it's called Every Noise at Once. Yeah. Hey, hiya. Good to be here. Good to have you. Super. So, um, this is this is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> this is apparently based on the Spotify information of of music. Um, so, uh, Wayne, if I may, what's your favorite? What's your favorite band? Favorite band. Or like any band that comes to mind. The first band that comes to mind. Any band you like. Deep Purple. Deep Purple, cool. Okay. Classic. Deep Purple, can't go wrong with Deep Purple. So, um, it has, these are the genres that it knows for Deep Purple. So you can look at um, Deep Purple, if you, if you clicked on these, uh, on, these, on these links, you can look at Deep Purple within the spectrum or within the genre uh, interpretation of this. So let's, let's look at Deep Purple in terms of rock. And if I remember correctly, the way they interpret this is, I always get these, I always get the... Um, is it graph? Yeah, yeah, it's a. Knowledge graph. It's kind of like a yeah. It's an algorithmically generated, readability-adjusted scatter plot of musical mm -hmm. genre space. Yeah, um, that's right. Calibration is fuzzy, but general down is more organic. Up is more mechanical. Left is denser and more atmospheric, and right is spikier and bouncier. That's what I, I tend to huh. get those mixed up. Huh. <clears throat> so Interesting. yeah. So New Order is among the rock, like compared to other rock bands, is more mechanical. <laughs> yeah. And so here, um, Alter Bridge Garbage. is dense and atmospheric. Oasis is dense and atmospheric. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Stevie Winwood is bouncier. Okay, okay, Robert yeah, Palmer is bouncier. Yeah. Wait, so what are the axes again? I, so from left to right mm -hmm. is dense and atmospheric and bouncier and uh, sort of, I think, it is more like I would is that like upbeat. Kind of I would look at it as yeah, upbeat or maybe funkier if you want to oh, look yeah, at it like yeah. that. And um, up is more mechanical, so maybe more um, more quantized rhythmically, like maybe more more tight in a mm -hmm. way. Whereas down, I would think is more sort of loose and organic. So mm, okay, yeah. So is there anything that that could is Simon Garfunkel extremely loose? Not loose is probably the wrong word. Let what did they say? Uh, down is more organic. Organic. Yeah. Okay. All Up right. is more mechanical. So I would imagine if you if you were to compare like Simon and Garfunkel to Tool, mm -hmm. I would expect Simon and Garfunkel to be down and Tool to be up. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe Dream Theater. I would if, if if you know any of those bands, I would expect those to be. So are we looking at just rock now, or rock as it relates to Deep Purple? This is rock, and then it's okay. it's relating within rock. It's it's relating deep purple. Deep purple should be here somewhere. Surely, <laughs> <laughs> you can show that. Um, that's a good question. Let's find out. Can you search for it. Yeah, um, maybe a whole different color. Maybe or deep oh, yeah, there you go. purple. There we are. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Yeah, so every noise. Every noise. Every noise. Dot com. So this is interesting in terms of um, how would you like what kind of um, um, information you could get out of this uh, in terms of you could maybe get genre and then its position within the genre on this map so you could have a you could have a matrix a genre matrix and see whether hmm. the um, if the band is in there at all yeah, yeah. and then if if, um, if they oh yeah that's right here see there's deep purple here and there's sun and got here there's tool here so, but is there somebody who's classifying every single one of these, or is there... Oh, no, they said algorithmic. They said algorithmic generated, yeah. Huh. Interesting. Don't know how. Maybe... Well, don't know if they're... If it's I wonder how we Let's see. Based with the axes. Hmm? Based with the meaning of the axes. It's classified in, in the scatter plot based with the meaning of the axes. Yeah, axis. yeah, yeah. So the... Um, but somebody must have somebody must have um, listened to all this stuff. I know. And said, hey, this hey, is hey. this is bouncy and this is not bouncy. Well, I suppose put through the algorithm I'm saying, the machine learning I'm saying, I had that uh, do I suppose according to certain rules. Mm. True, maybe. Because what we can do is we can we can find the 
the pulse and the spikes in the in the song, right? So it could have been that someone went through and determined kind of like some the of number of impulse sounds per time period or something and defined that as bouncy. And then and then they yeah, just had the, had the um, uh, machine go through and count those. What's, the, what's the impulse in the song here? Was, uh, well, if you have a if you have like a, a snare hit or a hi hat hit, yeah, or a drum, yeah, anything on a drum would have a relatively short and spiky, like a relatively maybe, maybe, short maybe, maybe, maybe impulse. Quite deep. Uh, it wasn't that deep. you don't necessarily get that information when you just look at the pressure. So you just have a really short sound. Maybe, whereas, uh, I suppose the, the the wave, I suppose, the music. Yeah, exactly. So anything, on the other hand, anything that goes, anything that has like a, an actual sort of measurable frequency, like I don't know, a guitar that goes, Wah, yeah, um, any any chord that is played on a guitar would have a certain duration, and you'd have a, a ring in phase, so or like an, yeah. an attack of it, and then it would it would sound for a while. But drums don't tend to do that. Um, cymbals ring out, I guess, but. Um, you, because I'm yeah. saying speaking, we had a voice prism sound. There also would be a certain prism sound for some mm -hmm. music as well. Wow. Wow. Mm. It's very similar to voice, right? Because you could probably use consonants for beatboxing. Mm. Yeah? Whereas you could use vowels to make chords. You can't really make chords in a choir oh, with consonants. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But you go. Yeah, I don't think that's possible, right? How could you, how could you make a chord by like going at the different? Uh, you could do it with. Mm. Oh, I guess I can't yeah. say. I guess I can't. Say. Could do it with. Mm, mm. Can't do it with W. <laughs> well, a, a yeah. W if you say it for a long time is basically a U. Mm. Yeah, you sound like a like yeah maybe a steamboat can. But yeah, yeah. so you can't really. Yeah. Or, or interesting, interesting. Yeah, with Y you can't do it because where would you start? Would it be Y <laughs> or would it be Y? Yeah. So you can't do those. But that is also completely sort of. We haven't even started with the video yet. <coughs> but <laughs> this is what we're going to be talking exactly. about. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what content um, is best for? Um. Ah, uh, it's the last session of the year anyway. So, <laughs> but. I was I'm, uh, one of the projects that I'm looking at at the moment is actually looking at um, uh, vowel sounds in language, oh, yeah. and um, I'm wondering what the like if you look at the at a sound to like if you look he, at he's in the same thing. So when it comes to understanding human language in noisy environments, mm -hmm. I think the best way to do it is to have the system select out our voice from the background noise I'm saying because it understands the sound of our voice I'm saying. So I suppose you could possibly so I suppose with me I talk to you and to you and you and you and you I'm saying my voice is pretty unique I'm saying. And I suppose, and, and, and this is an easy train them saying based upon word parts which are phonemes, or even I suppose more, mm -hmm. more uh, in, 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 in a more narrow way, even in terms of the three alphabets. So they mm -hmm. have, I suppose, the, the training of the, the system saying, this I'm saying, via uh, a the person reading out certain uh, carefully constructed uh, sentences, I'm saying, which I suppose use phonemes and which use Bells, I'm saying, I'm saying, as a way, I suppose, to have the system have an initial understanding of what your voice is, I'm saying, which then gets improved much more as you use the system by your iPhone all the time. Mm. Use all the time. Yeah, I think, uh, by the way, I'm okay. Hi. <laughs> Good evening. My name is John Anthony Paul Patterson. John Anthony Paul Patterson, nice to meet you. Good evening. Right, so, uh, yeah, Adam, Wayne, and uh, Marvin. Mervyn, sorry. Mervyn, an E, not an A, that's right. Um, I think, yes, yeah, so I think what, and I'm not 100% sure, I think what Siri does is it trains on your voice. So it'll learn a voice print, like a fingerprint. I think that's, that's um, that would be different to what I would expect an algorithm to do when it tries to classify music, because it, I wouldn't expect it to learn 
the music. So that would be, to me, that would be like, I don't know, if I listen to, or if, I, if the algorithm were to listen to, say, Alanis Morissette or Alicia Keys or so, mm -hmm. yeah, then it would learn about that musician. But I don't think that's what I would expect from an algorithm that I want to use to classify music. So I think what I'm, what I'm looking at is I would want it to count, um, the, say, the number of vowels that I use. And I could maybe I'd do a language parallel to this if I were to find... Um, out what hey um, if I were to try and find out what language I'm speaking it could help to count the number of in a, in a sort of overall sort of view uh, the number of uh, consonants that I used for example as a German I get often accused of speaking a language that sounds like a machine gun <laughs> I have no idea what this is all about I do not <laughs> think that is true but um, it's German has like the, the words are all like separated by gaps uh -huh. in the language and so on. Whereas in English has absolutely no case. It's just one single word that's just really <laughs> long. Yeah. And but although the words in German sometimes are as long as an English sentence. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but that's yeah, <clears throat> that's because we're better at it. We were talking about this. We were talking about this at lunch, and I couldn't resist. But someone was asking them, "What's actually the difference between?" Um, the, the German alphabet and, and the, uh, the alphabet used in English. <laughs> and we were joking, it has four more letters and it's better. Um, <laughs> They're very important <laughs> letters. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But with those letters, actually, um, that, that was what, I was what I was thinking of. Um, the, the umlauts, mm. yeah, they're, just, they're just a different sound. So there's, they're not different consonants per se. They're, they're like mixtures of two consonants. So that is why it's common in German. And, and when I write my second name, my second name is Björn. And mm -hmm. they, in German, you write that with an O umlaut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But a common way to write that is to write it with an O E. And if you yeah. think about it, if you think is about that common it, in German, or English? German sound. That's uh, well. I'm just writing it that way in English because I don't have to look around my keyboard as to where to find yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the letters and so on, because I'm just lazy. <clears throat> and so, if you if you look at what those sounds are in German, and you you basically smoosh them together mm -hmm. from the O and the E. If you go oi, 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 eventually it mixes, mixes up to an u. It makes sense, like acoustically, it makes sense. But does it not make sense? More no. sense just to do the German way and just have a letter for it. Yeah, I think. I, th I, I think that makes more sense. Yeah, it does it, eventually because it's used so often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think it. Uh, there must be more things like that where where the sound sort of where where you should be able to follow these sounds. And I'm, I'm currently trying to look at what kind of um, relationships we can see between languages that have like sounds that are similar like that like what mm -hmm. what sounds are actually similar between languages that mm -hmm. don't have any other similarities so are there are there sounds in um chinese say especially considered as a tonal language yeah. that we could compare to sounds in i don't know portuguese or yeah, you know yeah. um, or maybe uh, the specific new zealand accent of english or something <laughs> yeah. like that yeah, that would be, uh, that would be interesting. interesting. What's the what's the state of the art of like language recognition? Are we there yet? Uh, do you mean like recognizing which language someone speaks? L or? Well, like yeah, is is there like algorithms that are capable of doing that right now? Google, oh, I just okay. recently suppose has an impressive Google Translate actually that was, was I mean you just suppose when we when we in a foreign country and say it translates uh, for you uh, in a foreign language. But do you have to type in what language it's going to be oh, first, or does it know? It's, it's it knows? There is auto detection. Oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. But sometimes it gets it wrong. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like like if you speak English with a German accent, I think you're speaking German. Oh, that's a good question. I haven't actually tested that um, translate yet. I haven't uh, tested any. I've seen a couple of videos where people have supposedly spoken into a translating unit like that, yeah. and then it granularly translated it in their own voice, like resynthesized oh, really? into the other language. Wow. But <laughs> that, I, I wonder whether that was like some kind of prototype or a specialized training thing or the something. Gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I haven't, I haven't actually tested any of this kind of translation, but mm. what I sometimes do is, especially because um, my wife is Vietnamese and so I try to translate things like for her family mm. and it gets really funny when I try to read that. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Th talking about specific <laughs> letters, yeah. they have some crazy it's also things, a like two, yeah. two diacritics. I'm still, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the alphabet because I feel like yeah. once I've got that, I can actually, I actually know because it's a bit like the mixture of um, uh, Roman uh, letters, yeah. like the Latin alphabet and music, because there's so much tonal yeah. information in the 
in the alphabet. But it's yeah, I still haven't still haven't figured it out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Godspeed doesn't sound like an easy language to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. But it'll be nice to one day be able to um, to talk to my in laws and my <laughs> grandmother <laughs> grandmother in law? Yeah, grandmother in law. Yeah. And also I interested. also think when it comes to this, it's important also I suppose to be training the systems with common sense that well it's common sense knowledge I'm saying is a way I suppose to be able to interpret things and their environment in terms of common sense knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure I follow because do you mean in terms of um, like la the processing the language, like what you're, what you, what topics you follow out I of I mean, I suppose based upon a foundation of the common sense knowledge you have. So I suppose, we know, I suppose, how th this here is a chair, mm -hmm. although, and it's used for sitting on. Yeah. Or I can also step on the chair and get something out of a cupboard, or, or we'll touch that side on the yeah, yeah. Space, mm -hmm. it? Or you can pick up and use a weapon to wipe the off, I suppose. So, yeah. I suppose, but trying to be able to, to I suppose, be able to understand uh, our world. Yeah. In the common sense knowledge I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose there's a way, I suppose, to be uh, hopefully, hopefully, I suppose, creating the future machine uh, learning systems mm -hmm. which have volition in they can set their own goals. I'm saying, yeah, and and um, and be able to uh, uh, perform com complex tasks from many domains like human scaling. Mm -hmm. That's a part of the larger goal. Blended, of, uh, splendid segue. Also, um, <laughs> yeah, sure. The, um, we looked at inverse reinforcement learning for a little bit, at, um, like for one or two sessions, I think. Yeah, yeah. Ones, yeah. and that was Chelsea Finn's uh, talk, I think. I was yeah. um, and a lot about that is about um, how to uh, develop <laughs> algorithms to um, find a reward function, to find a, um, a way for the system to find out like what goals to set and what to look out for and what to. Um, like how to evaluate its own actions. Yeah. Because uh, they're trying yeah. to be uh, the, the psychology of thinking about. Hey! Thinking. Hello. 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 Sorry, I didn't mean to The psychology of thinking about thinking. Yeah. So, so Meta cognition. Be, be, be yeah. to, I suppose, be able to, mm -hmm. to, uh, 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 pro, to, to train the systems with metacognition. And you know, about also about a complex problem solving system mm -hmm. making methodology, I suppose, yeah. and and uh, and uh, new leadership program, I'm saying, and coaching, I'm saying, is way to, way to be teaching, I suppose, mm -hmm. the systems uh, to to hopefully even, I suppose, become self aware, I'm saying, and eventually, I suppose, and, uh, and I suppose more, more like humans. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not that hopeful anymore. I've been I've been working in an AI company for two years now, and oh, the, the Skynet is. Away. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, um, I think no, it's it's, we were no, no. We've been we we watched a um, we watched an interesting talk last week around this where um, the some of the some of the discussion was around um, is uh, should we really be all that worried about Skynet or are we just fantasizing about this weird amazing um, sort of you know almost godlike thing. That is that is going to come, or <clears throat> should we be worried with like real world about real world problems, such as um, a three D printer that helps to optimize <clears throat> or self optimize the production of say hard to detect weaponry and things mm. like that, yeah. And I'm to a to a large extent sort of looking looking back at what we discussed. I I, I agree that we maybe do not. We maybe do not talk enough about those things. Maybe we're too fascinated by this incredible idea of the big AI, and it's so easy to talk about Super something that is so fantastic. Yeah, but the the things that are happening right now that's actually really hard. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier and much sort of nicer to to put that aside and talk a bit more about sort of our oh, metaphysics or religion mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, when. Um, what we're, one of the things that we're doing, I think, with, with going through these lectures is looking at what are people working on right now? What's, what's the actual like, really tough thing that people are trying to crack right now? And the, the poker that you mentioned... Um, what was that again? Oh, sorry, no, you talked about pluribus, that's right. Okay. Um, 
the Polka that we mentioned before, the Polka system that was developed by Facebook, Pluribus, is one of those. Like it's that is a really fascinating thing because they solve the problem of a limited information game. Yeah, where um, in Go or in chess you can see the entire game board all the time. Both players have the same amount of information. Yeah, but in um, in a card game, half the uh, information, or not even half, like less than half, <coughs> is available to you. Um, the other player doesn't know what cards you have, you don't know what cards they have, you don't know what cards are left in the deck. Yeah, and yeah. I want to also say, so I suppose, is it more, I suppose, with just one deck, with multiple decks, I'm saying, or, 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 or how does the system work? So, uh, in, in po I, I don't know if there are different be, 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 rules for different poker games, but it would be as. I guess, you know, they might have five decks, I'm saying, so it's just you can't really count, count cards, I suppose, but. Yeah, but if you don't know which cards your opponent has, then even counting cards doesn't really help. But I suppose if I suppose you have, I suppose, counts and the, the, the whole deck, the game towards the end of the deck, I'm saying, well, you, you have more idea of like Blackjack, you mean? Pardon? More like Blackjack, where yeah. counting cards matters. Yeah. Whereas in poker, it's like there's a set amount of cards all yeah. the time. And uh, you would know your cards, and then based off that, yeah. you would make some decisions yeah. based on... But, 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 but I suppose, uh, I more thought in poker, I'm saying, that, that, that they... And then they have, I suppose, a pile of the, the cards, I'm saying, and then take them from the, from the, from the, the, the deck, I'm saying, and, and then uh, uh, I've thought that can cards are also important for, for, for poker as well. Um, um, I don't no, think so. Because you, you have a few cards, so yeah. when you say card counting, if I hold two queens in my hand, if I two queens up, I'll put them back anyway. But, 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 but I'm pretty sure I put the cards back, I'm saying, at the casino, they, 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 they throw the cards where you use. They get no, fresh that's, ones. For black, that's for blackjack. They don't uh, throw it. Yeah. Uh, okay, mm. okay, sure, okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That did. Yeah. But I'm saying, saying that reinforced learning can still do uh, limited information games it's just with enough compute power. Because Alpha, Alpha Star did StarCraft and it's like Fog of War and they were still able to, mm. to win games. But it's just because it's Google and they have the compute power. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> but yeah, the algorithms is, is just more efficient, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that... Uh, because I mean, Google was also working on poker, and um, so Facebook won that race. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if I was, hmm. I'm, it, one of the interesting interesting things about um, sort of this whole big league game and so on, I, f I find is that it was it was visible in the <coughs> difference between Alpha Star and OpenAI playing there. Oh, could you close the door, please? Okay. Uh, between Alistar and OpenAI playing Dota, mm -hmm. I think, because it felt to me like DeepMind were always like stacking their their enthusiasm a bit lower, sort of. Whereas um, OpenAI made like a huge uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <clears throat> which I guess smeared out the actual sort of AI effort a little bit, but mm -hmm. made it fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. so people are engaged, and it's it, it that is that has its own positive effects. And I wouldn't be surprised if DeepMind is uh, similarly going a different way and just doesn't take the time pressure so much. Maybe Facebook has done a really cool thing, and it's also interesting to see that Facebook hasn't, as not as far as I know at least, done much, especially in the reinforcement learning space, as a as a sort of global player. Like yeah, they, haven't they haven't been, they haven't, yeah. yeah, they haven't advertised and stuff much. Yeah, but they haven't really. I think now they're trying to get mm -hmm. that in because yeah. they've hired on um, that Noam Brown guy as a part of the team before mm -hmm. it was like a researcher, but now he's actually part of Facebook. So I guess they're trying to. Yeah. yeah. So it's really. Trying to dominant everywhere. Yeah. There's, there's, I'm pretty sure there's, I suppose, one very smart bloke, I suppose, who, who is working on artificial general intelligence. I'm saying, what's his, his name, I suppose? I don't remember his name, I suppose, but he uh, uh, has spoken at some of the. Singularity Summit, I'm saying, and, and he's a uh, very smart bloke, but I'm not sure what his name is. I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, there are a lot of smart people in RL and. Asia, AGI. Artificial General Intelligence. I'm pretty sure he might be the head of OpenCog, maybe. Open? Is it called OpenCog? OpenCog doesn't ring a bell. OpenCV. Um, open to be open. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't. Yeah, it's hard to hard to know. Yeah. Yeah. AGI is pretty broad as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. No, 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 no. Next topic. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's have a look at this. Um, 
at this at reframing control as an infer in inference problem. Um, right. Um, and actually, at this point, we're going to kind of transition the course uh, into uh, dealing with sort of the the broader ecosystem of RL related problems. So we sort of finished the discussion of core reinforcement learning algorithms, core algorithms for model free RL and for model based RL. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss a particular connection between optimal control reinforcement learning and probabilistic inference. Next week, I'm going to tie this into inverse reinforcement learning, which is the problem of analyzing behavior and determining what objective that behavior is trying to optimize. And then we'll have some discussion about things like transfer, exploration, meta-learning, and so forth. And then in the last couple of weeks of the course, we'll actually have guest lectures from researchers that are uh, doing cutting-edge research in this field. So uh, you know, at, at this point, these topics will really be more focused around uh, kind of, you know, current cutting edge research things that are partly meant to kind of give you some ideas for things you might want to try out in your final project and things like that. In terms of the homeworks, we'll have homework four, which will cover model based RL, and we'll have one more homework after that, which will probably cover exploration, and that's something that will be discussed a couple of lectures from now. Okay, so some uh, class notes. Uh, the important thing is that homework three <coughs> is uh, due soon, October 21st. And as I mentioned before, make sure you start on this one early. It takes a little while to get, uh, especially the image-based Q-learning stuff, to uh, get it finished running for 3 million steps. All right, so today's lecture. Today, we're going to talk about this question. Does reinforcement learning optimal control provide a reasonable model of human behavior? So, so far, we've mostly talked about the problem, uh, given some, some objective, figure out how to get an agent to satisfy the objective. Now we're going to actually begin discussing the inverse problem, given some behavior, figure out what objective that behavior is actually trying to optimize. And we'll, we'll see uh, next week why this might be useful in many cases. Um, and one of the things I'm going to talk about is how you know, pure optimal control or pure reinforcement learning, as we've discussed so far, often doesn't actually provide a good explanation for the behavior that we observe uh, in the real world from you know, uh, biological intelligent agents like humans and animals. Uh, and I'm going to discuss how we can derive optimal control and reinforcement learning as well as planning from more of a probabilistic perspective. So oftentimes when we observe some process in nature, the process is maybe governed by some underlying uh, you know, mechanisms, but then the process is also stochastic. And maybe we, observe, we have noisy observations of the process, and the process itself has noisy dynamics, so it really helps the model as a probabilistic uh, model. This is going to lead to a new formulation of reinforcement learning algorithms that looks a lot like the ones we've seen before, but in a subtle way is a little bit different. Uh, and we'll see how this can give rise to new kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms and also new kinds of algorithms for analyzing behavior for inverse reinforcement learning. And then next week we'll really talk about core inverse reinforcement learning algorithms based on these ideas. So today's lecture will be, is going to be a little bit more conceptual, a little more theoretical, and then we'll have more concrete algorithms next week. All right, so the goal for today will be to understand the connection between probabilistic inference and optimal control and understand how specific RL algorithms can be instantiated in this framework and how they differ from the classic RL algorithms that we discussed before. Uh, and then maybe understand a little bit about why this might be a good idea or why we should care about this sort of analysis. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of a discussion of optimal control as a model of human behavior. So, uh, Just to add, I think that's awesome because for one, I think we didn't delve deep enough into inverse reinforcement learning and the other being that's definitely not covered in the, in the Sutton and Bartle, in the basics of the book. So, uh, for uh, actually quite some time, uh, people who study human behavior, human motor control, psychology, that sort of thing, uh, have given a lot of thought to the question of whether human behavior, or animal behavior for that matter, can be explained as some sort of optimization process. So uh, this is, for example, some very classical photographs by Edward Muybridge studying, in this case, uh, human biomechanics. So this is a, a high-speed uh, recording of a person running. And this kind of thing, you know, you can kind of look at it and try to figure out, well, presumably the gate that the person's executing is optimizing for some particular objective. Perhaps it trades off metabolic energy against uh, their uh, desire to maintain some particular set point speed, et cetera. And more recently, uh, you know, in the 21st century, people have actually continued the study of this question with more modern computational tools, analyzing the degree to which, for example, the particular strategies people use uh, to reach desired locations for walking, reflect maybe some principles of optimality. In fact, the principle of optimality has been uh, one of the most powerful concepts in recent years to explain human and animal motor control, uh, both for locomotion tasks and also for uh, manual manipulation tasks. For example, human reaching motions can be uh, modeled fairly accurately with a probabilistic variant of optimal control, which is actually what we'll discuss today. Uh, as well as kind of higher level uh, behaviors. So for example, uh, probabilistic approximately optimal models have been used to describe how, let's say, taxi drivers choose to navigate uh, street networks in Pittsburgh. 
All right, so what's kind of the idea behind all this stuff? Well, the idea is basically this, that uh, we've learned that uh, if you have a reward function and you have either a model of the world or the ability to interact with a simulator of the world, uh, you can extract an optimal or near-optimal near plan by solving an optimization problem. So in the model-based kind of optimal control framework that we discussed a few weeks ago, this is the kind of problem you might be solving in the more classic reinforcement learning formulation. This is the kind of problem you might be solving. But in both cases, it's basically given some reward function, solve an optimization, get back uh, a plan or a policy. So that, that's what we've been doing so far. But if you want to use the, the principle of optimality to explain behavior that you're observing, what you're really doing is you're saying, well, if you assume that the person is doing this, can we figure out this? Can we figure out the R that caused them to do what they actually did under the assumption that they were optimizing some objective? So you could imagine doing this. I mean, the, the actual kind of optimization framework needed to infer R uh, given a pattern of behavior is a little bit complex, and that's what we'll describe next week, but let's for now just assume that you can do this. So you basically say, um, you know, I have a monkey in the lab. The monkey is doing some kind of motor control task. Maybe it's using this little joystick to steer the uh, little green dot to line up with the, with the red dot. And, uh, you know, here's what, uh, where it starts. Here's the goal, and you expect the monkey to basically do this. And then you say, well, let's uh, set up my uh, optimization problem from the previous slide, say the monkey is doing trajectory optimization, figure out the R that causes the monkey to reach the, the target, and that's sort of your explanation of what the monkey's objective is. Um, so that's all fine and good, and in general the principle of optimality does provide a pretty powerful explanation for actual behavior observed uh, with humans and animals. The problem is that if you actually try to do an experiment like this, um, the monkey is not going to perform this nice straight black line, the monkey will do something like this, or maybe a little bit like this. So then uh, the researcher studying this monkey will look at it and say, well, something is wrong here. I expected this monkey to be optimal, uh, and it seems to be doing some other random stuff that I didn't expect. Uh, so the trouble with this is that the monkey is doing the task, but like most animals and people, it's not actually optimal. Uh, it's a kind of approximately optimal monkey. And that's because the monkey has some things that it cares about a great deal, like it cares about reaching the target and getting uh, a little bit of juice as a reward. And there are other things that the monkey is a lot, a lot less concerned about, like, you know, it's probably a pretty lazy monkey. Uh, and uh, doing this perfect straight line path every time takes a lot of mental exertion and would rather just kind of do the minimum effort necessary uh, to get the juice rather than really overexert itself. So the crux of the issue here is that some mistakes matter a lot more than others. And uh, you know, actual real biological motor control is, is complicated. And there are a lot of complex stochastic processes going on. And it takes quite a bit of cognitive effort for the monkey to really suppress all of that and perfectly execute this beautiful straight line path. A lot easier for it to just kind of do a good enough job by doing this kind of wiggly thing. So some mistakes matter a lot more than others. The monkey doesn't really care about giving you this straight line path. It cares about getting the juice. So its behavior is going to be stochastic. On a good day, it'll do one thing. On a bad day, it'll do another thing. On trial one, it'll do one thing. On trial two, it'll do a different thing. But it's much more likely to do good stuff than bad stuff. So it knows it wants the juice, and it's going to reach that target with pretty high probability, even if it takes a kind of a wiggly roundabout path to get there. So now we might ask, well, can we actually write down a new notion of optimal control, a stochastic notion of optimal control, that will result in solutions that produce these wiggly blue lines, but assign very low probability to a path that doesn't actually reach the target. And this is not something that's actually covered by any of the formulations we've discussed so far. So if you set up policy gradient, you can accommodate stochastic dynamics, you can train a stochastic policy, but at convergence, that policy will prefer to do the straight line path. So what we really need in order to model the possibility that the monkey, or in general the agent that you observed, might randomly choose to do other things, but is much more likely to do things that actually reach the goal, what we need to do is we need to set up kind of a, a probabilistic model, a probabilistic graphical model for decision making that allows us to explain why good behaviors are more likely than bad ones, but a variety of different good behaviors might all be equally likely. 
So before, the model of decision making that we had was essentially this thing or a stochastic version thereof. The stochastic in the sense that uh, the rewards are being maximized in expectation under stochastic dynamics. But that's no good because that has just one solution, which is the black line, which is not what our monkey is actually going to do. So we don't want that. We want something that can explain why the monkey might choose to do slightly random, slightly different things. <coughs> so we need a graphical model. We'll begin with a graphical model that we uh, already understand, which is the graphical model that describes the relationship between the states and actions. These are the things that the monkey really has to reason over. So there are. Uh, at every time step, there's a state and an action. They influence the state at the next time step according to the dynamics P of S prime given S comma A. So that, we, we've already seen that. We already know that that needs to be part of our model because that's how the world works. So we could write down the following probability. We could say, well, what's the probability of seeing a sequence of states and a sequence of actions, which for, we can abbreviate as tau. So what's the probability of seeing a trajectory tau? That's not quite enough by itself, though, because the monkey isn't just doing random things. It has an intention. It's trying to reach that red dot so that it can get the juice. So there, there are some more variables in the system than just states and actions. There's something that represents what the monkey actually wants to accomplish. So we need to add some variables to model this. There's no assumption of optimal behavior if we just ask this graphical model, what's the probability of a sequence of states and actions? So for this graphical model, it'll just tell us, is this sequence of states and actions physically possible, which doesn't account for intent. So if we want to account for intent, let's add something. Let's add this variable that I'm going to call script O. And I'm going to call it O for optimality. And I'm going to add one of these variables at every single time step. And what these variables represent is whether or not you're being optimal. It's a binary variable. It's either true or false. If it's true, that means you're trying to be optimal. If it's false, that means you're just doing random stuff. So we might believe that the monkey, if it's a good monkey, it's trying to be optimal. But it's you know within the scope of all the things that it considers to be optimal, there's quite a bit of variability, which is why it might be a little bit random. You can also think of this as intentionality. And so think of this variable as denoting whether you're intentionally trying to do something versus just doing random stuff. And we're going to put one of these things at every time step. We don't have to do that. We could have just put one global variable that says O for everything. But it turns out that having this thing at every time step will make it very convenient for us to factorize our notion of intentionality over time and yield a uh, particular formulation that resembles the reinforcement learning problems we've seen so far. The high level intuition is that reward functions factorize over time and we're going to want and we know how to handle reward functions, so we want to get something that factorizes over time. But it's a it's a choice, it's a design choice so far. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is infer the probability of seeing a trajectory given that our monkey is optimal at every single time step. So this probability, this is our generative model of the monkey's behavior. So if we set up a good model, we would expect P of tau given O1 through capital T to assign high probability to the monkey's seemingly uh, stochastic behavior. Now we have to choose a form for this node. We have to choose a form for P of OT given STAT. And we're going to make what will at first seem like a slightly weird choice. But later on, we'll see that this slightly weird choice gives rise to a very elegant mathematical formulation. So we're, remember that, P, that, 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 that OT is a binary variable. And we're going to say that the probability of that variable being true is equal to the exponential of the reward at state ST and AT. You need a mild regularity assumption for this to be reasonable, which is that the reward is always negative. But if your reward is sometimes positive, just subtract the max and make it always negative. That's totally fine. So now you'll just say that the probability of OT being true, given ST and AT, is equal to the exponential of the reward at that time step. Kind of a weird choice, but let's go with it and let's see what it gives us uh, in terms of the equation for the posterior. So remember, we want P of tau given O1 through T. And from the de definition of conditional probability, we can write that as the probability of the joint divided by the probability of optimality at all time steps. So up to a uh, normalization constant, I can write that out 
as the probability of the trajectory a priori, so that first term, the P of tau, that's basically how likely is the trajectory to happen according to the laws of physics. So that means that trajectories that are physically impossible get a probability of zero. Trajectories that are physically possible get some non-zero probability. If you have deterministic dynamics, this first term is really just an indicator for whether this is feasible or not feasible. And then the rest of this uh, joint distribution is just the product of the probabilities of OT given SDAT. And the convenient thing about products of exponentials is that they are equal to the exponentials of the sums of the exponents, which means that we can turn this product of exponential r into an exponential of a sum of r. And now we get something that begins to have a little bit of a reasonable, intuitive explanation. So if we pretend for a minute that our dynamics are deterministic, this first term p of tau just turns into an indicator for whether or not our trajectory is physically possible. And the second term is the exponential of the total reward along that trajectory. So that says that the probability of the monkey producing a particular motion is zero for everything that's physically impossible, because you don't have a magical wizard monkey, you have a normal monkey. And then for everything that is physically possible, the probability goes with the exponential of the total reward which means that the most rewarding, the optimal trajectory, is the most likely. And then the other trajectories become exponentially less likely as they become less rewarding. So if there are millions of different trajectories that all result in the monkey getting its juice, that's the thing it really cares about. And it will assign about equal probability to all of them. Now, maybe the monkey is a little bit lazy, so it would prefer somewhat shorter paths over longer ones. But the difference between those is not nearly as large. So even the slightly longer paths still have a non-trivial probability. And now we have something that resembles a plausible probabilistic explanation for our suboptimal monkey. Does anybody have any questions about this probabilistic model? Do you guys believe that um, this is how monkeys uh, actually behave? <laughs> okay, a lot of skeptics in the room. Okay, well, we can come back to the monkeys later. But since this is a computer science course, what I really want to do is tell you about some algorithms that we can use uh, to deal with these kinds of models. Um, all right. So for basically the, the first half of this lecture until the break, what we're going to do is we're going to deal with this probabilistic graphical model and try to understand how we can actually do inference in this model and what the resulting inference al algorithms actually look like. As a preview, they'll have an uncanny resemblance to some algorithms that you've seen before. But before I do that, let me talk a little bit about why this is interesting, other than allowing me to tell you lots of cute stories about monkeys. Um, it's interesting because it can model suboptimal behavior, which is very important for inverse reinforcement learning. So if you observe somebody doing something, uh, you know, people do random stuff. And that random stuff isn't always very tightly informed by our objective. So, you know, I might be uh, going to the grocery store to buy some groceries, but my, wa my mind wanders a little bit, maybe I get distracted, maybe I you know, stare off at the, at the clouds for a little bit, but that doesn't mean that my objective has changed. I'm just kind of being a little bit random, and people do that. So if you can't represent the fact that your agents might exhibit suboptimal behavior, it's very difficult to infer their objectives, which is what we have to do in inverse RL. And inverse RL turns out to be crucial for more sophisticated forms of imitation learning. So inverse RL is a very important al basic algorithmic framework, and you really can't do that unless you have some notion of why uh, the agents you're observing might behave not perfectly optimally. This kind of framework also allows us to apply inference algorithms to solve control and planning problems. So probabilistic inference is a very, very well-studied field. There are a lot of uh, exact and approximate methods in probabilistic inference. And connecting this to reinforcement learning and planning gives us a lot of additional theoretical and algorithmic tools to bring to bear. And it also provides us with a little bit of an explanation for why we might prefer stochastic behavior over deterministic behavior, which can be quite important uh, for some topics in exploration and in transfer learning. So if you have a, very, a single specific problem you want to solve, you know everything about that problem, you know all the dynamics, you can generate infinite samples, then a deterministic policy will be optimal. But in more practical problems where things like exploration are a challenge, so you might want to be a little more stochastic than usual, or in transfer learning, where you might want to use what you've learned to apply it to other problems, then actually being a little more random can be very helpful. And this can give us a tool for that. Yes? Do you have a long time period of 
period, then the agent may not have the foresight to plan for long time periods. In that case, you will always be suboptimal. Right. So the question was, well, maybe another source of suboptimality is that if you have a really long time horizon, you essentially have to uh, reason at different levels of detail. And since you can't perfectly plan out all the details of your, mo of your behavior for a really long time horizon, that might be a source of suboptimality. That's absolutely true. And this kind of model does not account for that. So this is not a bounded rationality model. This is actually a uh, kind of stochastic behavior model. OK. So let's uh, talk about how we can perform <coughs> inference in this kind of graphical model and recover an equation that describes the most likely behavior given that these optimality variables are set to true. So this graphical model really has two types of conditional probability distributions. It has the probability of ST plus 1 given STAT, which is your dynamics. And it has the probability of OT given STAT, which is, uh, as, I, as I've said before, the ex exponential of your reward. There's also this one little detail, which is at the very first time step, you have a P of S1. But that's not really all that important, because it only happens once. And you know the rest of these happen every time. But there is one more CPD, which is P of S1. All right. So uh, how do we do inference in this thing? So there are three kinds of inference questions that we're going to want to ask. The first question that we're going to ask is, how do you compute a backward message? It might at first seem a little strange that this is the first question to ask, but it's the first question to ask because it really helps us answer all the others. So a backward message, I'm going to note as beta t as a function of SDAT, is the probability of the optimality variables being true from the current time step t until the end, given your current state in action. So uh, while this might seem like a slightly arbitrary question to ask, we'll see uh, afterwards that it's a very, very useful quantity to calculate. Because if you can calculate the backward message, you can actually recover the uh, near optimal policy in this graphical model. And that's the second question. The second question is, how do you compute a policy t of at given st comma O1 through capital T. So this conditional distribution is the equivalent to the optimal policy under this graphical model. It's answering the question, given that you are at the state and given that you are being optimal always, what is the probability of taking a particular action? And answering this question is essentially the equivalent to optimal control or reinforcement learning in this stochastic framework. And what we'll see is that calculating these backward messages helps us answer the question number two. So if you can calculate the backward message, it turns out to be very easy to figure out the near optimal policy, P of AT given ST, comma, O1 through capital T. Now there is another question you could ask, which is P of AT given ST, not conditioned on anything else. That's not a very useful question, however, because that's just asking which, which actions can you take. And the answer to which action, actions can you take is all of them. Right, so if the monkey isn't trying to do anything in particular, it can just you know, flail its arms around randomly. What we really care about is which actions is it likely to take if it's trying to get the juice. The third question that we'll study is how you compute a forward message. Now this one is a little bit peculiar. Uh, the forward message tells you what is your probability of landing in a particular state given that you've been optimal at all of the preceding time steps. You don't need the forward message to figure out the policy. However, the forward message turns out to be very, very useful for figuring out which states the optimal policy lands in. And while we will not need the forward messages in order to solve the forward reinforcement learning problem, we will need the forward messages to solve the inverse reinforcement learning problem. So today I will describe how we can calculate the forward messages. And then on Monday, I'll describe why you might actually want to use them. Okay. So let's start with the backward messages, because these are by far the most useful. So the backward message is defined as the probability of the optimality variables from the current time step until the end, given the state ST and AT. And uh, in general, when faced with uh, these kinds of queries, uh, what, do, what do we do? Well, we have a bunch of hidden variables, which are all the other states. And we need to put in those hidden variables, integrate them out, and re-express the message that we want in terms of the quantities that we have, which are these CPDs. So the game that we're going to be playing is we're going to try to express beta 
in terms of the probability of a transition and the probability of optimality, this exponentiated reward. And since this is going to be a recursive procedure in terms of the beta at the next time step. So we'd like to turn this into things that we know. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put in the next state. So for any distribution, I can always put in another variable and then integrate it out. So I'll put in st plus 1, and I'll integrate it out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break these things apart using the chain rule of probability. So by the chain rule of probability, I can take the um, all the future optimality variables, so from t plus 1 to capital T, and I can condition them on just st plus 1. I know I can do that because from the structure of this graphical model, if you remember d separation, o t is conditionally independent of o t plus 1 given s t plus 1. So I can do that. And I can remove all the other stuff on the right of the conditioning bar. Then I have p of s t plus 1. And p of s t plus 1 is conditioned on s t a t. So that's this bit. And then I have the remaining optimality variable at time step t. So all I've really done here is I've applied the chain rule of probability to break this up into three parts the probability of all the future optimality variables given the next state, the probability of the next state given the current state in action, and the probability of the current optimality variable given the current state in action. <coughs> so this thing I know. This is just my exponentiated reward. So I can stop worrying about that thing. This bit I also know for now. That's my transition dynamics. So we'll see how we can derive model-free algorithms on this basis also. So all I'm left with is this first weird term. And this first weird term, the p of o t plus 1 through capital T, that one I can uh, insert into it the action. So I can put in p of o t plus 1 to, uh, to t given s t plus 1 and a t plus 1, and then a t plus 1 given s t plus 1. So the first term in this product is just beta at the next time step. So this is beta uh, s t plus 1, a t plus 1. So if I'm proceeding recursively from the end to the beginning, I would know what this is by now. So I'm just left with that second term, the probability of the action given the state. But remember what I said before. The probability of the action given the state, not conditional on anything else, is just describing what can you do. And the answer to what can you do is whatever you want. right? So we can actually, for now, uh, assume that this term <coughs> is just a uniform distribution, meaning that it's a constant. We'll see later on why assuming this is uniform doesn't actually reduce the generality of this formulation. But for now, just take my word for it. Let's just take uh, p of at plus 1 given st plus 1 to be the uniform distribution, which means it's a constant, which means that we can essentially disregard it for the purpose of inference. So now we've expressed beta st at in terms of beta st plus 1, at plus 1, and the dynamics and the exponentiated reward, all things that we know. So if we start at the very last time step, at the very last time step, uh, of course, uh, beta st at is just equal to exponentiated reward, because there's only one time step to go. And at the second to last time step, we use this derivation to express it in terms of the last time step beta, the dynamics, and the exponentiated reward. And then we can do this recursively all the way to the beginning. Any questions about this derivation? Yes? So in the derivation, it assumes that we know those probabilities exactly? Right. So for, yeah, exactly. So for now, we're not doing anything with learning. We're not doing anything with model free. We're just assuming all probabilities are available to us. Okay. Later on, we'll see how these integrals can be approximated without knowing the true dynamics. And the spoilers that you do it with sampling, the same way you do everything. Um, OK, so here's the algorithm from time step uh, capital T minus 1 to 1. Express your beta t s t a t as your probability of optimality, so that's this thing, times the expectation with respect to the next time step, so that's accounting for this thing, of what I'm going to call beta t plus 1 s t plus 1, which is this term right here. And then calculate your state-dependent message by taking its expectation under your action distribution, so that's this thing right here. So calculate the state action message, calculate the state message, go one step backwards, and then calculate the state action message for the previous time step using the state message from the next time step. And then just keep going and going and going until you hit time step one, and then you're done. Then you've got all the backward messages. Now, um, at this point, some of you might be thinking this might start to look a little bit familiar. 
Let's take a closer look at the backward pass. So this is what I had on the previous slide. And I'm going to introduce some terminology with some very loaded letters. I'm going to say the log of beta t st, I'm going to call that vt of st. It's a good letter. I'll use the letter v. And I'll use the letter q to denote the log of beta st at. So these are some arbitrary choices. These are kind of my two favorite letters in the alphabet, so I'll use them. And then I'm going to express these equations in log space. So let's start with this one. Let's start with the equation that calculates the state message in terms of the state action message. Here I've taken the log of the right-hand side, and I've written it out like this. So if I were to take the log of the left side and the right side, it turns into the log of the integral of the exponential of log uh, dt, uh, sdat. Because remember that p of at given st is uniform. So that's just a constant in front of this thing. All right, now you might be saying that that doesn't look particularly interesting. I mean, that's the log of the integral of an exponential. But logs of integrals of exponentials actually have some interesting properties. Imagine that the quantity inside this exponential becomes very large. So let's say I have some numbers for q of s t a t, and I multiply those numbers by a million. When you exponentiate those numbers and you add them together, the biggest number is going to dominate. And in fact, the bigger those numbers are, the more the biggest number dominates. When you then take the log, you're essentially taking the log of the biggest number plus a bunch of other stuff that's really, really small. So as the q's get bigger and bigger, the log of the sum of the exponentials approaches the max. Because the biggest value dominates that sum of exponentials, so that when you take the log, the little numbers have minimal impact. So as Q of STAT gets bigger and bigger, the V becomes more and more similar to the max. We'll, we'll have to remember this, because this will be important later on when we have to come back and think about why our monkey was doing that random stuff. But for now, we'll, we'll sort of observe this as an interesting factoid, that this log sum x kind of has as its limiting case the max. Let's look at the other equation. When we express that equation in log space, again, you get something that sort of looks sensible, but a little weird. So you get, uh, you know, multiplication turns into addition in log space. So you have the reward that's coming from the P of OT given STAT term. And then you have the log of the expectation of the exponential of the next step value function. Uh, well, if you remember the value iteration algorithm, the value iteration algorithm, of course, looked a little bit different. In value iteration, your Q function was the reward plus the expectation of the next value, so all those logs and exponentials weren't there. And your value function was the max of your Q. Now, we kind of see that this thing kind of becomes a little bit like the max if the Q values are big enough. But what the heck is up with these logs and exponentials? Well, one thing we could observe is that if your dynamics are deterministic, meaning that only one next state has a non-zero probability, then this, expe this expectation uh, is not actually a sum. It's just the value function evaluated at one state, which is the one state that can happen given your state in action. So then the log and the exponential cancel out. So under deterministic dynamics, q is equal to r plus next v. So under deterministic dynamics, you get exactly line one in the regular value iteration algorithm. But under stochastic dynamics, you get this weird thing. So what's up with that? Well, this weird thing is actually a little bit of a problem. This weird thing will describe some behavior that is not quite the behavior we typically want to see in optimal control. The reason is that, just like over here, the log of the sum of exponentials looks a little bit like a max. So instead of saying that my Q function is going to have uh, added to it the expected next value, it's going to look a little bit like the maximum next value. So this is a kind of optimism bias. This is saying, since you assume that you were being optimal everywhere, what your inference procedure will actually do is just tell you that given stochastic outcomes, the, the more desirable outcome is actually more likely. So if I believe that I, uh, you know, that I did the right thing and I got a million dollars, my probability of having bought a lottery ticket is higher because my probability of having won the lottery is higher. That's just the consequence of posing an inference question like this. 
And we'll actually see in the second half of today's lecture how this optimism bias can be removed in the stochastic case by employing the tools of variational inference. But for now, we'll just say that in the deterministic case, everything is all good, deterministic dynamics, that is. Later on, we'll deal with stochastic dynamics. All right, any questions about this? Okay. So the summary of the backward pass is that you have these backward messages, beta, that are functions of states and actions. They tell you the probability of optimality from now until the end, given your state and action. Uh, and you can compute them recursively from the end to the beginning via the procedure that I had before. And the log of these backward messages is sort of Q function-like. It looks a bit like a Q function, and if you squint a little bit and pretend that all your Q values are big and your dynamics are deterministic, you get something that looks a lot like value iteration. Which is not too surprising because this inference procedure is a dynamic programming method for doing inference, so it makes sense that a dynamic programming method for doing inference should look a lot like a dynamic programming algorithm for doing reinforcement learning. They're both just doing dynamic programming. All right, uh, let's very briefly revisit this question of the, of the action prior. So I sort of swept this under the rug before. I said that P of A given S is just a constant. And uh, you might uh, challenge me and say, well, why, what if I don't want it to be a constant? Um, so here is the deal there. If the action prior is not uniform, the way that that changes your equation is now your V has a Q plus log P of A given S in there. That's the only change that happens. If you have that change, then uh, before your Q function was this R plus log expectation exponential of next V, we can also define a Q tilde, which is R plus the log action prior plus the expectation of the next V. And now I can rewrite my V as the softmax of Q tilde, right? So this. Sorry, that ran past me a little quickly. Um, isn't that meant to be d a of t, like in the in the integral, like the integral of the exponential? Which one? The in v v of s t. Yeah. There's no. Um, infinitesimal. So is that just a typo where he's missing the D? Or because you would if you were to if that's if P of O T plus one to T given S T plus one A T plus one is equal to the exponential of um, Q, yeah, which is O T plus one, blah 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 blah, which is like beta. Yeah. Um, then multiplying that would give you just the addition of the log, right? Or am I? I think there was a slide earlier that kind of did go over that, but I yeah I can't remember. Um, So and then Q tilde. Maybe it's one of those cases where in a minute or so it'll come out. <laughs> and this are exactly the same. And what that means is that if I have a non-uniform action prior, all I have to do is add it to my reward, redefine my reward to be R plus log P of A given S. <coughs> and then switch back to a uniform action prior, and I get exactly the same equations. Let's just pull it quickly. Let's so if you're going to choose. Sorry? So yeah. I suppose, so, 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 the P is the probability on the top line? Yeah. For probability, I suppose, you know, the outcome of, of T plus one, so let's put the, the, the outcome beyond T, in the future prediction, I suppose, conditional on, on S T, T plus one. What's, what's S again? S is the state. So the. I look at S as either state or situation. So, so how, how, how I suppose it, uh, the outcome is, is the goal of T plus one given the future state plus one. Uh, yes, so the the um, the probability in the first uh, row is the um, the, Optimal, the optimality, optimality yeah. yeah, from the next step to the end mm -hmm. given the state that comes next. Oh, so, 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 so I suppose so, so, yeah. so, 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 O is 
optimality not, may not have come. No, it's not outcome, it's optimality. So whether, um, so in the case of the example that he had with the monkey, where the monkey was supposed to match the X with his dot, yeah, um, or their dot really, um, the, like if you were to um, move the joystick literally diagonally up, then that would be the optimal, like the shortest path. Yeah, but the monkey probably you know is bored or doesn't really look at the screen well, and really only wants to just the rules. Yeah, exactly. So the monkey might uh, well the monkey will get juice every time he match he matches the um, yeah the X. Yes, that's all but um, to the super fine motor control is actually really hard. So it would be good enough to just wobble your way up there, and that's what he's saying when your optimality would be being on the diagonal line, but you want to give some leeway around not being there all the time. And you want to capture the probability that you're um, getting to your to your uh, uh, to the state that gives you a higher reward um, if you're close to the optimal line, but not what fully on it. What you say is it's just saying that that, that that O of T plus one colon capital T, I suppose, means the optimality of the future state, uh, the future optimality. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the end state, yeah. conditional on, I suppose, the future state. Yeah. So um, if you were thinking of it as, um, if, you, if you think of a, of a um, chessboard, like a checkerboard, yeah, and you start, say, in the bottom left-hand corner, and you go diagonally um, up by one step, and you want it to go to the other corner, right? So the, the shortest path would be just to go straight across the, the checkerboard. Maybe it might yeah. go all the way across. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that. Yeah. That, uh, I'm pretty sure the way it's going on, say, that it might. You, you might be able to, to, to keep on going diagonal all the way across. You might, you, you might, you might make the other, other end, I suppose. It's, the, the, yeah, the, the, that's what he was talking about, that the monkey might just not pay attention or that. The motor control is just difficult, no, 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 and so he's no, lazy. No, 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 for a checker, what I'm saying, it has, has I suppose, uh, checkers, I'm saying, black and white, I'm saying, and I mean, if, if you go, go uh, plus, I suppose, if you go from here to there, it might make it all the way, all the way to the end. If you go and do it, I can't remember how that goes, but I'm saying, but, but I suppose, uh, maybe you can, I don't know, it's a squeaky, probably, probably you can. Yeah, so, um, the, let's just, uh, regardless of colours of black and white, just, let's just imagine, just um, a grid like that, and you're moving. You're moving across diagonally. Sure. Yeah. So the the question is that they're asking is like if you're if you're here now. Or so if you're here now. Actually, I'll just draw. I think what you're saying is like there was a smaller number of states that would be easier to jump across, but because this yeah, is like so a million states or yeah. whatever it is, it's a lot harder to. So the way that I understand this, and anyone, please jump in and correct me if, if I'm getting this completely stuffed up. So so, and then, <coughs> if I start here, yeah, um, then if this is my S of T, this is sort of where I am now, um, and the optimal, the optimal path, let's say this is like my, my yeah, capital T, capital T. Yeah, no, 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 this is S of, of lowercase t. So, um, yeah, and my optimal path, this is of course a bad drawing, optimal path would be, um, here and here and here and then here. Yeah, that would be the shortest path. And then let's say um, this is this is my S of T. But then I'm saying because R is I suppose the the the, the, the optimal outcome here, what I'm saying, wouldn't R be also capital T as well? That's be where we go to. No, the capital T stands for like the terminal. Yeah, state that would be so yeah, I would I guess by definition be capital T, but there wouldn't necessarily be any other R. So that's not really the issue, I so think. So how do I suppose so T, T plus 1 minus 2 T plus 3? So yeah, but it could be that if, if I'm if I'm like just willy-nilly moving around, then it could be that I'm going like this, right? Sure. So, sure. Um, so the question that they're asking is, um, all the, the O, like this sort of this squiggly O that they've got there, yeah. yeah, that is only true for this state, this state, this state, yeah, and this state by definition, of course. So the probability um, for O to be true in S plus one, if um, let's say I'm I'm going a squiggly one here, and this is no longer S of t, but now this is, yeah, then the probability of 
um, all being true, i.e. the next state, let's say this being S, S T plus one, yeah, oops, it's, oh, um, um, is the probability of me going from here to here, yeah, because only here, as this next state that is accessible, um, is all true, always a binary variable. So it's either true, 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 or it's not true, not true, not true, not true, not true, because none of these are on the shortest path. But I'm saying, can you all also possibly get rid of it as well? Uh, yeah, but that's, that's my shitty drawing. So <laughs> yes, you, you could go there, yeah, or you could go here, but that would be have to be covered by um, all not being true. So that would, like, if you were looking at a P, of um, of all uh, t plus one to t, yeah. This is not only looking at what giving given s t plus one, yeah. So this is looking at the probability of all being true all the way from the next step to the end. But so but they, but that could only be true here. So we're trying to get onto the design. Adding during process and saying, trying to start adding during process and saying, and for that, that, that pathway to the end. I'm so sorry, so I don't you, know. you, you, you can see, I suppose, this, this here as the optimal adding during process from, I suppose, T over ST to, to capital T, yeah. sort of the outcome saying. So I suppose it's the path I'm saying. So if you're here, you have to get the other adding during process there and follow it, but that way. Yes, so. that's right. Super. So the question is, what's the probability to go here and then stay? On the yeah, 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 I suppose it's base, but it's still the monkey. Uh, and the, the problem is that no, that's the monkey is just a the monkey is just uh, an idea to, to uh, illustrate like the the problem itself. Yeah, the, but, but, the principle but, but, behind but, but, it is but, but, what, what I'm saying. Point I'm saying to suppose be basing your probability and saying upon the uh, upon the uh, creation process and which I suppose is based upon. <laughs> The knowledge is for the monkey in creating the outcome. Uh, while that is in for the real world, probably that's totally true. Um, what he's looking at is just the theoretical model. So his his assumption was let's just say for for the sake of you know figuring this thing out that we know the probabilities of the monkey doing this. Okay, like, sure. Yeah, sort of. Or that we know the dynamics of of the world. Okay. Yeah. So that's what they that's it's what they're looking at with it's the impressive. so. Thanks, guys. Have been be patient with me. Oh, no worries. I've actually with um, with I've talked about this with uh, Andrew um, on Slack a little bit. Yeah, if you if you're oh, right. I hope it will come back. Um, I'll put a um, beginner's guide for reinforcement learning because we've actually been going for a while. I'll put a beginner's guide with the stuff that we've gone through. Um, onto um, the Slack channel as a pinned item. So if, if you send me your Slack group. We have, yeah, we have a Slack channel. So if you send me your, your email address also, yeah, in the, uh, like either via Meetup or uh, in any other way, I'll uh, invite you to the Slack channel. And um, that, of course, goes for you on the internet as well. Um, or whatever to email. I'll just send it as a, as a Meetup message. That would be easy. Sure, yeah. Sure. Um, and oh, that's not coming back. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll uh, also have a few, let's try this again. Um, we'll also have a few sessions that are dedicated and marked for uh, beginners of reinforcement learning to get a bit into. Which is definitely me. Sort of, yeah, so we'll, we'll no, start a bit further at the beginning. Yeah, and the, a, a, good, a good way to get into it is, um, what is it? Not, um, is the, um, book by Sutton and Barto, um, Introduction to Reinforcement Learning. That's a pretty good start. The, um, there's a series of lectures by David Silver, which is also pretty good, illustrating a lot of the very basic topics. Um, I suppose the, the first couple of lectures here should give an introduction to, to bandit algorithms and so on. But there's, if I remember correctly, there's a lot of control theory in there. That might not be um, necessarily the easiest thing to get into. Um, there is a, my, my favorite um, reinforcement learning course, if you will, is on uh, Free Code Camp. It's by Thomas Simonini. Uh, I can't remember if it's thomassimonini.org or simonini.org. But if you Google Thomas uh, Simonini, um, 
he's got a really nice series of um, very sort of long and, and um, uh, easy to understand uh, intros into reinforcement learning. And he uses a lot of games. So he uses uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, he uses Doom, all to demonstrate like um, deep Q learning and things like that. So it's, it's good fun. Thomas who? Thomas Simonini. How spell that? S-I-M-O-N-I-N-I. S-I-M-O-N-I-N-I. Simonini. And he has lectures too online. He has, yes, he has lectures for all the um, video, uh, like his videos to all of his uh, free, co free code camp um, courses as well, yeah. And the, the cool thing about that is um, there's a GitHub repo for it as well. So you've got um, notebooks that you can work through. Um, he's got basically solutions for all the problems. So you can cheat and just start with the solution and execute those. Um, but what I found really cool was like to go through those yeah, and try and understand them, try to read them, and then um, close them. If, <clears throat> if you're me, delete them, because um, I, of course, kept opening them, looking at them. Um, but then try to reprogram them, yeah, because that way you, you try to remember what he did and how he did it and what, what really is, uh, what, what, which steps you're going through and how to solve them. Yeah, I suppose, what, what, what's Thomas Simulini's, uh, what, what's his area again? Uh, he does reinforcement learning. He okay. is a reinforcement learning researcher, I think, uh, I think in Paris. He's definitely French, but I don't know whether he's in Paris at the moment or whether he's in the US somewhere. So, sometime next year, can I do a beginner's course on reinforcement learning? Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm not sure yet because um, we've been talking about whether um, uh, for a weekly course, whether we are kind of progressing quite fast in terms of, of um, looking at stuff, and then it might be really difficult for people to catch up. And so I'm not sure yet what a good frequency would be to do a beginner's course, like whether you know every two months or uh, quarterly or something. Um, and I think as we as we progress with this, um, it's also going to be a bit difficult because it'll always be, I think, just a beginner's course in the sense that we look for two hours at um, an overview of what uh, reinforcement learning is. But of course, that won't boost you right <laughs> next to or right in, uh, uh, up to um, the, the material that we've covered so far. While at the same time, I think, just like in, in if, you, if you do physics, for example, um, if you know, like, you know, the basic Newtonian mechanics and so on, you can do a lot of physics with that. Um, and then while you might be looking at particle physics in particular, um, general relativity might not be all that important at that point. Yeah. So you, you, depending on the, on the topic that you're, in, uh, that you're looking at, um, the basics will always be handy and you might just miss out on a particular discussion of a particular type or topic. Um, so um, deep deterministic policy gradients, for example, which we discussed recently, would not um, be covered by uh, inverse reinforcement learning. You could still look at it and understand it. Like for example, for here, for this, uh, if you if you'd gone through the basics and the value iteration, um, for example, algorithm that he was talking about is a very very basic, very fundamental idea of dynamic programming. If you've gone through that, you could link that back. To what he's discussed, yeah. To me, like looking at this, like oh, oh God, calculus again, and then just looking at that, and I really, if I if I ever came across a chain rule of probability, I've probably forgotten about it, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be able to derive that off the top of my head right now. So this is something that that um, it's good to have, and then be uh, related back to something that you know. When you've gone through value iteration and so on, and you can kind of look at that and go, oh yeah, 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 okay, I know where he's going with this. I know why the Q of S T and A T has this structure of like the, the reward and the log and the expectation. <clears throat> yeah, so you, you you recognize those. But then um, this this particular the, the slight differences is what you would look at for this particular lecture. So you only have to put that on top of what you already know. Yeah, I suppose it E being the expectation and probability. Uh, yes, the, 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 this is the, in this case, it's referring to the log of the expectation sure. of the exponential of the value of the next state. So the value of a state um, expresses, I guess, yeah, you could look at it as how good is it to be here, like to be in a particular state. So in terms of, um, again, if you were to look at the grid world, if you wanted to 
um, walk across to a certain space, then to be far away from your goal might be a relatively um, worthless, if you will, state. Right, Not sure. a very good state. Yeah, and especially if you're in a state that could be, say, um, if there's a lot of walls between you and the goal and you can't go move towards it very quickly, then that would be a very low value state. Also, yeah. is, I suppose the expectation always the mean or can that mean other things as well? I'm sorry? Is the expectation the mean or can mean other things as well? The um, mean? The, the average. Mean. Yeah, the expectation is not the... No, the, oh God, I'm... Um, the expectation is, it uh, is the it's like the... The value times the probability yeah. for every every possible next outcome. Yeah, so it is. Which is the mean? Is the mean? It's not the mean because it's not the, mean. the um, well, you can it's sample an, it's it. It's a probability weighted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. so it's a it's yeah. a sample. Yeah, so you, you can you can sample it and that, and that way get the expectation. Um, but, 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 uh, what we'd say is more exposures for. Uh, I think possibly there is the mean, and then the. Expectation might be the population, or is the population the expectation for the population or for the sample? I'm sorry. Is the expectation from the sample the population? Um, in this case, it would be the sample from uh, the, sorry, the expectation derived from or like gotten from a sample if you use a Monte Carlo method. But the expectation would the, still the, 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 be in the case of a stochastic simulation. sorry. Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah. You can, well, in Monte Carlo, you don't have to do a simulation. Don't have to do Monte Carlo simulation. If you do Monte Carlo um, in reinforcement learning, it could just simply be that you run an experiment uh, multiple times mm -hmm. okay. so that you get samples of your um, of your environment, samples yeah. of the of, of the values. Yeah, Yeah, but I think here it's kind of thing probably will have access to the population because let's say the number of actions is discrete and it's four, so you can actually access and check all the four actions. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you could probably, yeah, you could probably explore all of that, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but let's say, um, let's say, uh, let, oh, right, let's say you have, do you, do you know Windy Grid World? No, Windy, okay. Windy Grid World is a, is a system where um, you, have a, you have a grid like the one behind you on the wall, but there is a, a wind blowing from a certain direction. Yeah? A bit like wind. So the, um, at each transition, yeah, there is a decreased probability to go against the wind and an increased probability to go with the direction of the wind. Okay. Yeah? Like wind windstock. Kind of, yeah. So like the you would you would go um, you would be basically be likely to be blown over. So there's a similar one that's called um, frozen lake, where there's this where there's a probability that you sort of slip on the ice and then you end up in a different state, right? Sure. And so, um, in this case, you don't have the mean per se. You can't say um, um, my <coughs> the the value of the state is the mean. It would be it would be a sampled mean in the sense that you would look at the different um, transition probabilities. So how likely is it to get to that state? For example, if you, if you had a state that was like really close to the reward, then in principle by itself, yeah, that would be a quite valuable state. But if the probability to get to that state, to that high reward state, was very small, that would reduce the value of being in that state. I suppose he does suppose that it's almost like I suppose the line that best fit I'm saying, and I'm saying the, 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 the path I suppose from I suppose S one to capital T. Mm -hmm. and I'm saying maybe maybe I suppose there being here I suppose there's this much error I suppose between uh, observed uh, mice observed expected mice observed I'm saying. Is why why the 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 error from the path that you yeah. path. You mentioned chi square maybe or something. Sort of yeah, I don't. I wouldn't look at it like that because it's not always that. This this being a grid world is just an example. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you could look at it as, for example, um, if if the if the um, if this was a landscape and not a grid world, then you would have a third dimension as well, right? So you you could, for example, have. The, uh, a huge elevation between your uh, reward state and the the field next to it, so that the and on the on the on the other side on the other field to it, there could it could be much flatter, yeah, it could be sort of a much shallower slope or something, and then to get in there would be much much easier 
So even though you might um, you might be very very close to the reward state on that field. You're talking here about the most local and uh, local and global maximum, or not? Or not? No, it's not a it's not a maximum. I'm I'm just talking about like the 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 mean that we spoke of before, the expectation value. Yeah, um, you could literally look at it as an expectation. So let's say let's say you have a you have a wall of ice, right, and the, the reward is on top. You wouldn't expect to get there to get up the wall every time. So you wouldn't expect to get the reward every time. The reward value, like your 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 idea of how good it is to be in this state at the bottom of the wall, is reduced. By your expectation of slipping down the wall and having to try again. Well, you're not supposed to. You're supposed yeah. to plan what the what, what, what the best path is. But understanding. Yeah, plan uh, exactly. Understanding what, what the environment is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what the value function is for. So the expectation, yeah, is dependent on how likely you are to get there. So so in in a deterministic system where you literally like um, when the transition probability is one. I.e. E. like in chess, for example. Guaranteed. Sorry? That's guaranteed. Exactly. Yeah, right. So in chess, the transition probability is pretty much one. Like there's no, like, you know, there's no magnetic field or whatever. There's no wind. You, if you move your pawn one forward, and it's your turn, obviously, then it's going to go one forward. That's the transition probability of one. That's always going to happen. Yeah, but if you've got the pieces. Sorry, you've got the pieces though. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you know, that's, the it's depending on whether your action goes through, whether your action will happen or not. Yeah. Yeah. Does. it's like yeah. if you take this yeah. action, what's yeah. probability? Yeah. The next thing happens. Yeah. Wouldn't it check me? But imagine, imagine you had a, imagine you were playing um, chess with Edgar Allan Poe, and <laughs> there was this this blade swinging across <laughs> the chessboard, yeah, like in the pit and the punchlo, and then, then you're not it, sure your opponent. Exactly, exactly. Sort of like if you're not, if you if your opponent waits well, long enough, then the blade can come back. And the, the, the good example is the. That's yeah, it's, true. It's, a, it's a bit of a bad example. Is the is the car breaking? So there's a chance of. The, the surface being slippery. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the a better one. Brakes failing. So yeah. the intention is to stop the car, but actually kind of, through the unseen yeah. circumstances, the yeah. the braking can be not effective. You can crash it. Yeah. Then so, in the, yeah. Another car. Yeah. Or as we had before with the with the wall that you were trying to climb onto, so but it's ice and you slip mm -hmm. and you fall. Sure. Yeah. So that that's the those are the differences, and that what in, that's what informs the um, the expectation. But you would it would become a mean in a way like like Piotr said a, um, um, a probability weighted mean if you took a lot of samples if you did a Monte Carlo um, approach if you took a lot of samples then you would eventually get uh, if you took infinitely many samples you would eventually get the value as well because we're, we're moving towards the grand mean. I'm sorry. We're moving, moving towards the. And uh, the, the, the stabilized probabilities, I suppose. Uh, I got to know yeah, I guess. Yeah. So you would you would um, you would sample like this law, law of large numbers, right? Sure, you would sure. sample the same thing as as the actual value uh, value uh, function. Yeah. So and that's the that's the that's the difference between the just the plain mean and this and the. I think there's two. I suppose one is called law of numbers. What's the other one called? There's two things that are pretty similar. They be different names. Law of numbers. There's another one too. Do you know what that one's called? Which is very similar to that? Oh crap. Um, you know, never mind. I just noticed it's it's after six. Um, I ha actually have another uh, engagement elsewhere, well. so I've got to I've got to run. Um, I'll pick this up. Uh, thank you all for coming. We'll we'll um, carry on next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for everyone on the web who will hopefully watch this in the future. And capital T. Super. <laughs> yeah. Um,